Thank you for coming. Thank you for, for, for joining us in this uh, talk about design as catalysts. And we, what we'll do is um, present uh, three projects mainly, and I'm gonna show you a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit of um, somewhat of our background or my background as, a, as how we approach in a way our, our design or idea of design and how it relates to catalyst. And, and then Tico will also uh, show a little bit of what he's doing, the, the incredible work he's doing in Casa de las Ideas, a project that um, I uh, designed, well, Adriana and, and me designed, and then Tico has been uh, is tremendous in kind of creating a series of activities and maintaining the building and going and, and, and interacting with the people in the community. Anyways, I would just, just uh, talk a little bit about me. Uh, I'm uh, Marcel Sanchez Pietro, right? It's there. And then uh, Adriana Cuellar, which is my partner. And we are Crow Studios, CR Studio. And we are both uh, from Tijuana, originally from the border. And uh, we've been practicing here uh, for a few years now. We, we've been living in uh, around different parts of the world. And uh, in a way, we have been interested in researching and uh, being part of the academia. I'm currently uh, uh, associate professor at the University of Berkeley, and Adriana is a professor also at USD. And we are both uh, interested in kind of working in the border, in the conditions of border, but also working in the sense of marginalized and kind of underserved communities. So part of our research is in, in how to kind of uh, work with this type of community. communities in architecture, what is the stake in, in architecture to kind of work in these areas. Anyways, uh, now I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give it to Tico. Tico. Hola, Marcel. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Yo soy Tico Orozco, Francisco Orozco. Soy gestor cultural y pues de alguna manera virtual les agradezco su visita a Casa de las Ideas. Es este espacio en el que hemos trabajado temas de prevención de la violencia desde hace algunos años y de los que vamos a platicar el día de hoy. Eh, yo soy gestor cultural, soy promotor cultural de los últimos 30 años aquí en la ciudad de, de Tijuana. He dirigido espacios culturales, principalmente teatros, espacios de artes escénicas. Estuve en el Teatro del Estado en la ciudad de Mexicali, en el Teatro del Secud en la ciudad de Tijuana. Y eh, mi última responsabilidad en ese sentido fue como gerente general del Palacio de Bellas Artes en la ciudad de México. Cuando regreso a Tijuana, yo soy tijuanense. Eh, me entero de este proyecto y pues desde aquí, aquí estoy desde hace ocho años en, eh, participando con este con este grandioso proyecto que nos emociona mucho. So I'm just going to really synthesize <laughs> the very, very, very the, the, what uh, Tico said. Tico, I would just say that he has been a social entrepreneur for many years. He has been working with the communities in different projects. And I would just highlight that he was... Uh, in charge of, uh, uh, of uh, social and kind of events. In fact, I don't know how to name it exactly, but uh, the Bellas Artes is one of the most important institution, cultural in institutions in Mexico, in Bellas Artes in Mexico City. And then after many years of that experience, he came back to Tijuana and uh, he has been involved in Casa Les Dias, this project that we're, they were talking, we're gonna talk in a few minutes and he, he has been crucial, crucial in the way of how to kind of get this uh, project going and being, uh, creating a very impactful kind of transformation in the community. So thank you, Tico, and we'll start kind of going from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so here I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, a little bit about our practice in the sense of I'm gonna just come out, I'm gonna show you a little bit about our, where we are, and uh, sorry if I disconnect. Hopefully you can see me still. So um, I am on the border, we are part of the border and we're just gonna kind of do this kind of quick kind of uh, uh, situation. And I'm gonna uh, show you, I. this is my house, this is where I live and, th and this is the, where, where every day in constant reminder of what it is the border. And so I'm gonna show you what we'll see there, right? What you see there is the, the border, the international border. So this is my backyard in the property line, the property line is the international border. So right there on the other side is the US. And this is something that we have been interested in kind of working this idea of what is the architectural element, an architectural element that kind of has impacted us in many ways 
how we live and what are the conditions so that ecological ramifications of, of, this, of this war. So in that sense, in one second, we're connecting back to, hopefully you can see me now. Okay, so uh, like I said, uh, I'm gonna share now my screen of the presentation. And I'm gonna go full screen on that one. So now you can see that. So anyways, like I was saying before, that's our backyard and what you see, what you saw there. So this border has been a constant reminder of the inequalities, the disparity between these two nations, and also how this uh, border has created a series of illusions, ambitions, and kind of imaginary uh, prospects of what the city is. And in this case, what you see underneath, right, is that the image, the image that is being sold into Tijuana, the, the idea of the house, the castle, but the realities of this context. That, and we have, uh, in a way, talked about that this context is a. Now, I want to say that it's a negative word, but it's not. We don't see it as such. It's opportunistic landscape or idea of how to understand this landscape as a series of opportunistic kind of conditions that people are trying to negotiate in this border. So also has uh, the idea of how uh, even the, the series of buildings that have existed through Tijuana through the years have been demolished, have been disappearing. So it's a city that is, have been reinvented itself, uh, a city that memory has been a constant challenge, how to kind of preserve a sort of memory has been a constant challenge. And also the adoption of different conditions of being in the border, right? Like the, the commercial aspect of the malls or the Walmart or these kind of series of elements, these images, they have kind of almost uh, created an illusion of what the prospect of prosperity should be. So in this regard, the idea of the border, uh, we have been challenged to kind of find opportunities, find the, the way that architecture could in some way, like we want to talk more about the catalyst of a way to produce a, a sense of change. One project that we work and we usually don't do uh, competitions, but this competition was about uh, how to create a new point of entry to Tijuana. And this was a competition by Arkin. And so in this case, we said, well, let's try to do this, this, this uh, competition. We usually try to not work in competition. We just say, well, there's so many conditions that are out there that we need to kind of work and get our hands on. So we try to kind of more create our own type of projects. So this is about also how to produce an engagement. And next case, like I was saying, this, this became a, a good point to kind of uh, give us for, for reflecting of what we are talking about. So in this case, the idea of the border, we talked about that it's not about creating a point, but it's more about what is this space really about? To, we were talking about that this space is, Chanzeli says it's to France or kind of uh, Socalo to Tijuana. We were considering how the idea of an architectural element, or let's say this an urban um, infrastructure of that scale, could become a, a, an element that kind of gives the, the identity and gives a reflection in a physical form to the city. So they say, instead of trying to dilute the border, instead of trying to fight the border, or trying to kind of bring it into different ways, why don't we create a space, a space of engagement, a space that becomes a space of collection, a space of constructing the narrative of the city. So in this construction of the narrative of the city, we also, uh, work on projects like, for instance, in uh, the research that I did in Rome about uh, Fernando San Felice, where more specifically when I was in the American Academy in Rome, but more in understanding the stairs in Naples. So these two projects are totally opposite, but they're trying to understand how these infra infrastructural elements or architectural piece are embedded into the urban fabric. In this case, uh, Fernando San Felice and the proliferation of these stairs react to the containment of the 16th century condition of trying to maintain the city and the stairs became irregular kind of developments of architecture to kind of densify the city because the uh, Spanish ruling at that moment, they were trying to contain it. So the stair became an opportunity to grow vertically, to densify vertically. And then that transformed the typology of the city. So these stairs that are very beautiful and very kind of interesting in the architectural process, they really changed the, the idea of the city, but also subverted the containment of the city. They became a mechanism to grow illegally, 
but subverting the idea of people just who are inside the city and the people who were outside the city. So in this regard, talking about the architecture or how can architecture be uh, an element, right? So we will I will show three projects in this case that try to talk about that in the sense of what is the civic condition, what the value of civic condition, and how this idea of civic condition of architecture constructs that. So one of the questions that, um, that we have been doing or studying is, for instance, we always ask this question of our environmental conditions or sustainability conditions. So how much does your building weigh? In fact, Mr. Fuller asked this to, to, to Norman Foster, in a way of saying, if your building is very light, then the impact, the environmental impact is minimum, right? And, but we, for us, is not how, how much a building is weighing, it's more how, how much your building contributes to city condition of the city. So how can you value the city contribution of the city? What is more of an understanding of space that is uh, not about just only gathering or, or the notions of public or the values of space, but it's as considered as a space as a resource um, to measure and to generate potentials. So the idea of this space is about creating opportunities or the idea of civic is constructing opportunities where design is understood as a catalyst, right? That creates these platforms for even considering uh, the revealing social inequalities, the enhancing of education opportunities, the promotion and empathy, or the space of negotiation. So this idea of designing in space is not about uh, creating uh, a sense of, like say, lead accreditation or well, that there's like, no, no, let's, let's consider how to kind of create a series of criteria to evaluate space and saying, yes, like for instance, we, we can evaluate environmental like lead accreditation, but in this case, I'm not advocating for creating an evaluation of criteria as civic, but do we, that we do need to think about how do we construct even private spaces or any type of space that the value of civic contribution that generates to the city. So in these questions of saying the practice embedded in uh, social entrepreneurship or the idea of how the design is, is a, a sense of creation of platforms for opportunities, construct this active engagement of the architecture to be flexible, to be transformative, and to be, in a way, a medium to be calibrated on. So in this case, for instance, now I'm going to go into the project. This case tries to do that in three terms, like the PAR, TAR, and uh, uh, PR and PAR, let's say uh, an evolution of FAR. What I'm talking about FAR is floor area ratios that controls the idea of density, but PR is productive area ratio in transformation area ratio. And these two are, they were trying to incorporate here, we're trying to test the idea of how the space is being interacting or kind of transforming in those conditions. For this case, the project was uh, uh, a proposal for Infonavit. That they asked us to design this um, prototype, uh, social housing prototype for this co uh, community in Tecate. The, the Colonia Hindu, which is a, in the majority of what they do is the production of brick and the derivatives of the clay. And the majority of the product is being exported to the US. So this is a community in Tecate that is very linked to the production of a product that in this case, the product is the clay, but they consume the land, right? They live and consume the territory of land. So in this case, we were trying to say, how do we work with this community to create a prototype that using the idea of the resource that is in there, but also understanding the evolution or transformation or the growth of that family and how do we really live and work in the land? So in this case, what we produce is a series of uh, uh, alternatives for a prototype, the essence, the beginning of the house, that was the essential element. You can say that this is what you see in front of you is the essence of that volume of that uh, prototype. And then understood that the, the families come from Oaxaca, to, from Chiapas, and they come and work with them. They, the, the family is always in constant transformation. They reduce, they uh, compact, or sometimes they grow totally. So we needed to create a prototype that is able to kind of produce this kind of transformation. And we created a module where it's in essence a standardization but the patio became the idea of the architectural element, the patio became the way to negotiate the idea of growth, but also it became the element to negotiate the, the idea of coming from work. 
So the pack, imagine you're working and play in every day and you come to your house. And so the patio, instead of becoming a typical entrance, the patio becomes the entrance, but it becomes a cleansing, a transformation and going to your space. And that also created a series of modules that the, the, the building can grow horizontally, but also can grow vertically. So all the entrances, the windows, the elements are in the same size and then same categorization, and they can be transformed in a very easy way to kind of grow horizontally or vertically. So here you see an image of what is going to be, uh, what idea could be a, a more kind of growth up to the maximum, growing horizontally and vertically, but the patio, once again, the central piece. And here we receive that more the essence of that module that at the end, you have one bedroom, you have one, the kitchen, and you have the, the common area. But the patio, as we were saying, it becomes a central place to kind of proliferate. So you can grow in this direction, that direction, and the other direction. And this idea also of directionality, the factor of transformation error ratios and the factor of productive error ratios is in essence also deployed into the urban fabric and saying at one moment the unit can be a productive and saying it's not anymore a house, but the unit that you attach becomes a la an area or a space of work. And, and how working in the landscape or working in the brick also becomes the resource to kind of produce your house. So we work with them in trying to construct a series of alternatives of how to use the brick. At the end, the project, uh, we didn't know that the project was a prototype of becoming for, um, for a pan housing. This is a master plan by uh, Moss Architects by Michael Meredith and Hillary Sample. When they created, a, they selected around, if I recall well, around 40 something prototypes from 100 and, or more than that. And they built all these prototypes in this, what they call the, the laboratory, the social housing laboratory. I would say this unfortunately was constructed in one single space. I would have loved to have that space in reality where the community was designed, but at the end, it was a way to kind of bring the, all the resources of different parts of the world, in different parts of the country, to kind of see what are the potentials of creating more affordable housing. And this housing uh, was built uh, under uh, $8,000. So it, the whole uh, main prototype was built in, uh, under $8,000. The budget for it was $10,000, $10,000 or more around that, a little bit more maybe. But the concept was also how to create a resource of, uh, of building it under budget and also creating a mechanism of $2,000 plus dollars, or let's say in this case dollars, but creating that leverage to saying you can kind of invest in a commercial area. A little bit not like we we're talking about at Avena, you can just grow, but also creating the sense of saying you need to create or create alternatives or opportunities to create a commercialization or another incentive you can create that is not within the architecture, but also take it from the budget, take it from there and create another opportunity. So here you see the prototype and the idea of the patio, the idea of how the space constructs that. The other elements, right? And that modelization of that. Very simple project. Like I said, it's a very, very low, uh, a very economic way, right? Simple, the interiors trying to take up as much advantage of the possibilities of that. So the project, in, in, it became the second most affordable, right? From all the projects. And you can see here once, some of them that were like $16,000, $13,000, and us were uh, $8,000. And, and it was published in, in the uh, Architect Magazine. And we're very, very interested in saying, yes, it's not about, uh, sometimes we need to know the architecture, what is, what is, is it really contributing, right? What are we really trying to accomplish there? And so here we are trying to accomplish just the minimal affordability, but also creating a, a, a sense of how the money, how the element is also creating other alternatives. So in this idea of living and working, and then we create another prototype, another project in this case was more dense and more vertical. And in this sense, the ideas of the stair and the ideas of live work experience they came about in this type of project and saying now the idea of catalyst is the opportunity that this idea that only we live in, 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 in our houses is not just living or dwelling, but it's also about an, an element of production, once again, the productive area ratio. So by strategizing the stair in this point, we're saying, well, instead of having the rooms always uh, paired to each other, if we totally separate them, if we totally put them in the opposite end, then we have the opportunity that the front unit, in, in, my, in, in one case or, 
or in different uh, alternatives, people can transform this space into a commercial area or start kind of grabbing the 50% of their unit into creating another source of income. You can see that many of these, many of these populations that uh, are working in social housing, you can see almost that 40 or 50%, at least 50%, they are working in their houses and they need to produce another source of income. So the house becomes a generator, it becomes a sustaining kind of element to hold the, the family. So by doing that strategizing, creating that, the stair gives that opportunity. So here you see, right, the, the alternatives in saying, well, then it could become a, a, a shop or a kind of tailor shop. It could be a, become a little restaurant or it could become all the things as a, a more as a workshop. And so then you give this flexibility of people kind of choosing how much of, the, of their uh, unit they need to kind of make it into a productive nature or a dwelling nature. So the stair gives that opportunity, like we were talking about how much contributes to kind of the civic and the, the relationship of, of kind of that space not becoming only private, how it becomes part of the fabric, on, not only in the first floor, but the multiple levels that becomes in that density. So now we're gonna talk about uh, a little bit more about the project that working in, in, uh, with Tico. And in this case, we're, we're gonna say how, uh, this idea of the elements or the pieces of how the choreograph of these pieces create, uh, once again, the framing or the way we, con we are going to kind of, the opportunities for things to happen. So I'm gonna pass it along with Tico talking about this slide here. Claro que sí, Marcel. Les voy a platicar un poquito del contexto histórico, económico, social, cultural que tiene el área donde se instaló esta que en un principio se llamó Biblioteca Digital de Camino Verde, como se llama la zona, y posteriormente Casa de las Ideas. Camino Verde nació de una invasión, históricamente la mayor invasión de tierras que ha habido en Baja California, eh, en este, en este lugar, pues obviamente al ser invadido, al, al llegar de, de alguna manera ilegal a, a habitar la, la zona, las autoridades pues no se sintieron muy contentas con este hecho y fue una zona que fue relegada durante muchos, muchos años. Una zona que tuvo su propia autoridad, que tuvo su, su propio eh, contexto y entorno económico, social, eh, no tenía escuelas, no tenía centros de salud, no tenía ningún espacio eh, público comunitario, eh, tenía sus propias autoridades, incluso un, un dato muy curioso es que tenía su propia cárcel. Entonces, al estar tan relegada de la, de la ciudad, pues fue una zona que... que poco a poco fue generando un contexto de violencia importante. Cuando nosotros llegamos 30 años después de su fundación, cuando se, se instala eh, Casa de las Ideas, cuando inician con este proyecto, tuvimos la, la fortuna de que previo a la instalación de Casa de las Ideas se hizo una serie de, de actividades, se hicieron una serie de actividades que eh, permitieron que la apropiación del proyecto fuera mucho más simple. Por ejemplo, se realizó un taller llamado La ciudad de mis sueños, donde la gente de la comunidad decía qué, qué quería en este parque que se estaba construyendo. Entonces ellos eligieron en un espacio tener un campo de fútbol, tener una, un área de, de ejercicios, con, con aparatos de ejercicios, tener canchas deportivas de, de, de otros deportes, tener espacios verdes, tener un centro comunitario, tener una biblioteca digital, que es lo que es Casa de las Ideas. Y, y entonces cuando todo esto se construye de acuerdo a las necesidades que ellos expresaron, y más o menos en la ubicación que ellos dijeron que era la más adecuada para cada uno de los espacios, el proceso de apropiación que para los proyectos socioculturales es sumamente importante, pues se dio de manera muy simple. Nosotros llegamos, instalamos Casa de las Ideas y la gente ya lo esperaba, este espacio cultural que sabía que ellos habían propuesto, que ellos mismos de alguna manera habían diseñado desde, lo, desde, desde el imaginario. Desde de su comunidad, como ellos le estaban soñando. Eh, 
cuando yo, aún yo estaba en la Ciudad de México, eh, un poco después de que concluyen los trabajos de obra de, de Marcel y Adriana, eh, cuando le es entregada esta Casa de las Ideas a Tijuana Innovadora en Comodato para desarrollar el proyecto que aún contiene, eh, la, la casa fue de alguna manera invadida también por un actor político y, y lo quiso convertir en un espacio que muy fácilmente se podía vender porque era uh, la casa del desempleo, le llamó, del desempleado le llamó él, ella y lo que iba a hacer ahí era hacer carteras de, de, de posibilidades de empleo colocar a la gente, conseguirles entrevistas, ayudarles a hacer currículums, eh, vitaes, etcétera, etcétera todo lo necesario para poder conseguir empleo sin embargo, la gente no aceptó que, que fuera asignado el espacio para una tarea distinta a la que ellos habían uh, dicho desde un principio, desde que habían diseñado su lugar eh, ideal. Entonces, a, las, a los 10 días, la gente se manifestó, la gente se puso en la puerta, cientos de personas exigiendo que se, que se devolviera el lugar y se regresa a la Casa de las Ideas y se vuelve a entregar a Tijuana Innovadora para que continúe con este proyecto que, que dato curioso, aún no iniciaba. La gente ya lo quería, aún no iniciaba el proyecto. So I'm just going to try to, you know, many important things that the Tico touch upon here, and I'm just going to try to kind of synthesize in two or three lines. It's going to be difficult, but it's very, very many things. The thing is that um, this project is not a project that happened in one year or less than one year. It's a project that took many years of work. Before any building was there, there was a lot of work of going into the communities, trying to talk to the people, trying to kind of identify the needs, trying to kind of see where the problem is. One of the things that were there, of course, this is a city that was one of the largest invasions of territory, irregular settlements, that people had their own kind of law because there was a, a, a prison, their own, they had their own prison, they had their own kind of police kind of situation, they had their own kind of rules in many ways because it was isolated from the city. And in one point was considered one of the areas that, with the highest crime rate in Tijuana. So it was a, it was a very kind of uh, uh, stigmatized condition of, of the society. But in that regard, the many uh, resources and many people trying to involve in the government also trying to kind of participate in how to kind of create a change in this space. So many people were collaborating, talking to leaders and trying to find a, a how to kind of, kind of change this, this relation. Anyways, in that regard, um, we're going to talk about a little more about the, 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 the things that happen in the process that uh, Tico touched upon and we're going to show slides. But I will say that the channelized river, but via the channel was a, a center of focus of, of uh, trash, contamination, but also dividing one side of the, of the, of the population from one side to the other side. So the, the, it was a scar. What, this is something that is repeated throughout Tijuana, that these uh, elements of the river becomes these kind of scars that kind of become focus of uh, of trash and contamination, but also a division between communities. But, uh, but anyways, so we'll move along to, to the next one. So in here, um, one of the things in, in, I'm going to talk about more from the standpoint of architectural kind of conditions, and, and Tiku will talk about more about the, the things that happen in there. And one of the things in talking about that the, we were, we were um, asked by Cedesol, Cedesol was the, the, the government institution, right? Secretaría de Desarrollo Social, which is a, the, the, the development social uh, agency trying to create this infrastructure. And they asked us to create a digital library. And there was a digital library, a social kind of um, uh, community center in several, uh, uh, a football field, a skate park. There were a series of infrastructural elements that were talking to the community what they need. For us, they say, well, we want you guys to create um, a, a library. And we were saying, okay, a library, let's talk about a digital library. A library that is, becomes the living room of, this, of, the, of the community, that is a library of accessibility to information, right? It's not so much about creating, because we were concerned of saying having just books there, but also how more the idea of uh, computers and events that were going to happen in there to create accessibility. One of the things that we were thinking, well, we had a very limited budget with $100,000 to create the whole building. We created two or three moves and saying, well, we need to kind of create a stage. We need to create a, two entrances because of course we need to kind of control them what is inside. And 
things that we were we we, we mistakenly did a design proposal in certain things, but were very surprising. There was okay, it was good in the, in the sense. So we created this building that starts to kind of create a bridge. So the buildings on top of the river, I know it's very controversial, but created a bridge from one side to another side, so people can kind of really kind of if there is a flooding or there's a problem, they can connect to one side to another side. And the other thing is that we we decided to kind of bring to the top this building like I show it here. So we there was an amphitheater that was going to be like 50 meters from there. And we said, well, why don't we just tuck it in there and we lift the building up and it becomes a series of tiers that we can have the computers, but also can become uh, semi-conditions of classroom. The main space becomes this collective space that uh, activities can happen, but also becomes a collector, a, a podium for people to discuss ideas of the problems that becomes in the society. But also the entrances, the entrances become this kind of uh, ways demarcating the, the, the access, but also become stages, right? So people can kind of uh, stand in that part and then the plaza or the idea of the outside area becomes a way of talking to the viewer, the people, and even the entrance becomes a way to amplify the voice. So it becomes an element, but also people can use it as a goalie or a sucker. So we didn't know, right? But we were saying, well, how can these two or three moves that we're going to create in architecture can have a range of things to happen in that space? We didn't know, but we create the platforms. So here you see now uh, the idea of the building and uh, the idea of the building, of course, is wide, but we, we, we we thought we don't want to create, or we thought it was not appropriate to create a building that had the, the idea of the material as the first thing. So we said the concrete is not the most important thing or the wood or the way you perceive the materiality. So we didn't want to kind of talk about enamorment of materiality. We said, let's create a white building in a sense of a canvas, as a sense of kind of registrating whatever can happen in there. So we were saying, well, if people want to create murals, if people want to kind of create things, we created a white building for that. And this building is just more about not the materiality, but more about the choreograph of things that can kind of play along. So in this case, the only moment that we uh, create a, a, a situation is in the entrance. And this we work with the tile to kind of accentuate the access of this building. And we wanted to also to say that this building, you can go and touch and not have a fence around in the perimeter. So the idea is that, yes, you need to protect what is inside, but you can go all the way to the building and touch it. It's not that you have the building and then you create another fence. This is one thing that is very typical in any building that we constructed in, in Tijuana, that you create a building and always you start fortifying the fence. So say, well, the, the building itself is a container and the building itself is the one you touch and kind of create the perimeter. So you see, you see also that we wanted to play with the idea of how, for instance, uh, kids coming from the, the bottom part of the river, walking all the way to the top, that they can go in and kind of rest. So the stairs are just access to the building, but also become these moments of rest. So kids, you can see kids coming along and can kind of hang out in this space and they move along and then go to, to their houses. So the trees are already grown, but the idea is it also was designed that, that the way the building creates, creates moments of shade and creates moments of kind of uh, controlling the climate in these micro kind of conditions between around the building. So here's the main entrance, right? And the main entrance that we created in the, in the front part of it, has been used to kind of have uh, collective kind of gatherings or kind of speaks or kind of uh, events in, in that sense. And also how this space uh, becomes a backdrop, becomes a stage of a backdrop. So the whole project is a series of stages, it's a series of kind of theaters, let's say, or a series of kind of ways of constructing uh, platforms for dialogue, the idea of communication, and the building is trying to support that. So what happens, what Tico was talking about, suddenly we were in construction. And when I was in construction, suddenly one day the building gets hijacked and then it was by this politician and says, no more, the building is not anymore a library. The building is going to be the, the like Tico was saying, the, the, the building of an employment to help people get employment. But it was interesting, all that process, the all that process that was before that in working with them and even in the construction process, working with the community, talking about what is the purpose of the project and then getting involved the community, participating with them in the process of creating this, then you understand that the catalyst, so we're saying design as a catalyst becomes that is not only just the element, but all the process that people really got involved and engaged and they started protesting. 
So here's a people protesting. So we have been working for three years. To, somebody just comes and takes the building. It's not, it's not right. It's not for us. It's for the future. It's for the kids. So, so education is the best thing they can leave us, the heritage they can give us, the opportunity they can give us. So people protest it, and then the building comes back, right? So I will leave it there, and then Tico is going to talk about a little bit more when the building was turned, right? The building then suddenly, one, I remember very clearly, I was there, and then even the person who says, don't worry, uh, architect, the building is going to come back to us. And they said, I'm not worried for me, I'm worried more for you. And they said, yes, we want this building, we want it like it is. And it's interesting because still, up to this day, many of the buildings has been preserved in many ways, right? It, it has been, it had, there has been some kind of graffiti in it, but the majority of the time, it has been white. People have been preserving that building in that sense. Anyways, at this point, then is when Casa de las Ideas comes along, and then we start. They start structuring what a series of what the goals are there. Tijuana and Guadalajara. Tico. Sí. Bueno, todo esto, esto que comenta eh, Marcel eh, es muy interesante. También eh, vemos en algunas imágenes y eso, eso me hace recordar. Eh, ¿Cuántas veces me han propuesto que hagamos algo para que los mercados eh, que se instalan, los mercados públicos que se instalan alrededor de Casa de las Ideas, se, se muevan de lugar a una zona donde no interfieran con el funcionamiento de Casa de las Ideas? Ahí siempre la respuesta ha sido que es el, el proyecto de Casa de las Ideas es tan comunitario que necesita de, este, de esta vida alrededor del, del espacio para que pueda tener éxito el mismo proyecto. Nunca hemos permitido que, que a ninguno de los mercados se le mueva, ni a, los, ni a los comerciantes ambulantes que se instalan alrededor de Casa de las Ideas o incluso en el mismo predio. Pero son, son vendedores que tienen 20 años instalándose ahí. Casa de las Ideas apenas tiene 9 años que se construyó. Entonces no, no podemos llegar y cambiar las, las costumbres, los usos, eh, la, la, la cultura de, de, de la zona y su comercio en 2000 ya, ya regresando un poquito a la línea de tiempo que les presentamos en 2013 se abre ya como casa de las ideas y empezamos a generar un, un modelo de, de gestión que es básicamente un espacio cultural comunitario un poquito entendiendo el contexto de la zona una zona con poca oferta educativa con poca oferta cultural eh, un poquito segregada también del resto de la ciudad. En ese sentido, lo, lo que queríamos era tener un espacio que satisfaciera este tipo de necesidades de, de los cerca de 40.000 habitantes de, de Camino Verde, pe, pero que también le abonara un poco al tema de la prevención de la violencia. Camino Verde durante muchos años se mantuvo en el primer lugar de índices delictivos de la ciudad. Es decir, Tenía el primer lugar de internos en el sistema penitenciario. Tenía el primer lugar eh, en actos de violencia que tenían relación con Camino Verde. O sucedían en Camino Verde o alguna persona de Camino Verde había uh, uh, cometido algún delito en otra parte de la ciudad. Entonces, por eso era muy importante que un proyecto de características culturales, utilizara el arte, la cultura, como una herramienta de transformación social para trabajar con las nuevas generaciones. Y es, es de, a partir de ahí de en lo que basamos nuestro modelo de gestión y, y donde enfocamos todas nuestras actividades. Entonces, en 2013 abrimos Casa de las Ideas, en 2013-2014 trabajamos con la agencia USAID, para hacer una gran implementación en las cuatro zonas de mayor índice delictivo de la ciudad. Temas, en el caso de nosotros, talleres artísticos, talleres de capacitación artística con enfoque de prevención social de la violencia. Todas las actividades que hacíamos, que, hacíamos, que iniciamos haciendo en ese momento, con este enfoque de prevención, promoviendo las habilidades para la vida. Diez habilidades para la vida que sostiene la Organización Mundial de la Salud, que en la medida de que sean incorporadas por las poblaciones, tienen más posibilidades de tomar decisiones acertadas para mantenerse al margen de la violencia. Eh, entonces, 2014, eh, en una colaboración con el 
del British Consul de la Ciudad de México. E hicimos el programa de danza para la convivencia con Community Dance, un colectivo de Londres que, que vino a trabajar a Tijuana. Trabajamos también con la organización Crece Leyendo, donde hicimos una, una, una serie de actividades que llega hasta 2019, donde lo con apariencia de un programa de promoción de la lectura, lo que hacemos es acercar a los públicos adultos para que conozcan el lugar, para que se involucren en actividades del de lugar y les sea más fácil eh, incentivar que las poblaciones eh, de niñez, adolescencia, juventudes asistan a, a Casa de las Ideas. O por lo menos no, no les... No, no les prohíban ir a, ir a Casa de las Ideas, porque la, la población más renuente a, a participar de actividades culturales normalmente es la población adulta. Entonces, con este programa nos, nos, nos apoyamos para eso. También iniciamos en 2015 el programa psicocreativo. Hay, hay tres niveles en los que se trabaja la prevención de la violencia. El primario, secundario, terciario. El, el nivel con el que iniciamos a trabajar en Casa de las Ideas, también un poco capacitándonos nosotros mismos en el trabajo de prevención con comunidad, eh, el, iniciamos con el tema de prevención primaria, que es la prevención universal, que se puede dar desde campañas, de, campañas en medios hasta espacios culturales que tienen un enfoque de prevención, el caso de Casa de las Ideas. Eh, después hicimos programas más destinados con poblaciones en, en riesgo eh, dentro de esta comunidad con altos índices. Una vez que ubicamos que el, la problemática inicial, y lo vamos a ver más adelante, la, la problemática principal era la normalización de la violencia, entonces empezamos a trabajar para desnormalizar esta violencia con poblaciones más enfocadas. Ahí empezamos a hacer prevención secundaria. Sin embargo, en 2015 ya hicimos prevención terciaria, es decir, no solo con jóvenes en riesgo, sino jóvenes en conflicto con la ley, jóvenes que son generadores de la violencia. Y lo, y lo que hicimos fue un programa donde trabajamos con ellos, nació en Casa de las Ideas, pero se desarrolla en el centro de, actualmente, centro de internamiento para adolescentes, que básicamente no es otra cosa que la cárcel de, de menores infractores en, en la ciudad. Ahí hemos trabajado con 110 internos, todo, la mayoría de ellos, un 90% de ellos cometieron homicidio en su adolescencia, uno o varios homicidios en su adolescencia, ya sea por, una, por un tema situacional o por un tema de crimen organizado. Eh, sin embargo, una vez que trabajamos con ellos, hemos encontrado que hemos tenido un 0% de reincidencia delictiva una vez que pasan por los programas. Este es uno de los programas. Otro que incorporamos más adelante fue el programa Hop Truck. Me voy a ir hasta allá para, para no detenerme tanto en la gráfica. Y el programa Hop Truck es un, un food truck que está en las puertas de Casas de las Ideas, que, que recibe a jóvenes con altos niveles de propensión a la violencia, niveles altos o críticos. Se les da un curso en una de las escuelas más prestigiosas de cocina de, de la ciudad, que se llama Culinary Art School, y después están tres meses practicando en el food truck para finalmente eh, dirigirlos a entrevistas con, eh, a restaurantes de la ciudad. El, en, este, en este caso... Son jóvenes que cuando entran al programa tienen niveles altos de propensión a la violencia, no estudian, no trabajan y cuando terminan el programa un 76% de ellos ya están insertos en el mercado laboral. Tenemos 0% de reincidencia delictiva y tenemos un 5% de recaídas en adicciones. Esto son cosas que surgen de un espacio que trabaja con la comunidad, que se involucra con la comunidad, que se empapa de la problemática de la comunidad y que empiezan entonces a surgir programas que, res, que, que responde a las necesidades que la misma población está manifestando a través de, de conocerlos en talleres, en actividades artísticas, en actividades culturales, de entenderlos, de escuchar sus saberes, de escuchar sus sentires. Y, y es como Casa de las Ideas viene poco a poco al paso de los años, eh, eh, respondiendo a estas necesidades. Y nosotros mismos, pues cada vez capacitándonos un poco más para tener mejores respuestas a las necesidades de la población. Si quieres, vamos a la, a la que sigue. Llega hasta 2019 la, la gráfica, 
que vimos anteriormente. Sin embargo, hay actividades en 2020 y 2021 que, que aún no actualizamos, como por ejemplo una firma con, de un convenio para una gran intervención que una vez que concluya la pandemia vamos a poder trabajar eso en comunidad. Vamos a trabajar desde Casa de las Ideas, ocho comunidades de Tijuana con una intervención de danza con la Fundación Porticus de Viena. Todo, como siempre, con enfoque de prevención de la violencia. Entonces, ¿cuál es el propósito del programa que contiene Casa de las Ideas? Eh, es generar, contribuir a que se genere una comunidad más segura, que la percepción y sea, más, sea de seguridad, que sea tangible la seguridad en la ciudad. Para contribuir a este propósito, nosotros pues, desarrollamos toda esta teoría de cambio que una vez que ubicamos el problema, que es que la niñez y las juventudes están expuestas a factores de riesgo, riesgos de que son desde los comunitarios, sociales, individuales, eh, una vez que están expuestas a estas, que, se, que, se, que los provocan diferentes causas como las que vemos aquí, escasez de oferta cultural, pocas habilidades para la vida, baja cohesión social y comunitaria, etc., pues, eh, dan como resultado la deserción escolar, la normalización de la violencia que mencionaba antes, las niñez y juventudes que replican comportamientos violentos y que generan que en esta comunidad cada vez se, se, se pueda, pueda llegar a ser más violenta. Entonces desarrollamos toda esta ruta que no es otra cosa que una ruta de navegación para llegar hasta la contribución que hace humildemente Casa de las Ideas en la ciudad, que es contribuir para que la comunidad sea más segura. Y para eso, en, en la siguiente, vemos que, que tenemos programas muy específicos. Eh, tenemos el programa de talleres de capacitación artística, estos con enfoque de prevención social de la violencia, que son en Casa de las Ideas y en otras comunidades, todo saliendo desde Casa de las Ideas en Camino Verde. Tenemos el programa psicocreativo, que es el que trabajamos con jóvenes eh, en internamiento, tenemos el programa Hop Truck, que es el programa que trabajamos para la reinserción social y laboral de jóvenes en riesgo y contribuimos también en el sistema local de prevención. Desde el año 2018 iniciamos una campaña donde a partir de Casa de las Ideas, trabajando con USAID otra vez, USAID, USAID como le decimos en México, trabajando con ellos hicimos un catálogo de todos los actores de la prevención de la violencia en Tijuana, alrededor de 90, entre academia, eh, iniciativa privada, sector empresarial eh, y, eh, y sociedad civil. Eh, alcanzamos a reconocer cerca de 90 actores que trabajan para la prevención de la violencia y trabajamos un proceso de articulación para tener un mejor impacto y poder eh, revertir datos tan importantes como, como el índice de paz en México que, que marca Tijuana como, como la ciudad más violenta de, del país, tomando como indicador principal el número de homicidios. Entonces, nosotros estamos trabajando con las juventudes para que en un futuro cercano, eh, Casa de las Ideas se convierta en un modelo que logra disminuir los índices de violencia a partir de que trabaja con, en la prevención antes de que sucedan las actividades violentas o con jóvenes que ya las cometieron, pero no queremos que regresen a eso a partir de que les instalamos nuevas capacidades de desarrollo individual. Okay. So here, well, I'm just going to uh, talk uh, a little bit, of, uh, explain this one says in a very thing. There's uh, the main thing of the building and what uh, Tico is doing is about prevention, crime prevention. One of the areas that all the programs that you're doing, like Hope Track, all these elements, is a series of activities to try to, try to kind of help the community to kind of detach themselves or kind of see other alternatives of, of preventing crime. So they're working with people who, in one point, they were, uh, they were uh, part of the prison. A lot of people were part of involved in crimes. And so how to work with this community and kind of give them other alternatives. So series of activities like for instance uh like Tico you see him here on the left and he can talk about a little bit and saying almost they had this kind of radio station where kids will go into the community talk about what it was going on a series of art so the idea of art and culture becomes this mechanism to create prevention that's what I'm trying to synthesize what all the Tico was talking about and also in the during the weekends we have this kind of series of events that the idea with the building on the backside becomes an amphitheater and also the wall becomes a series of kind of uh, uh, 
uh, movie nights or kind of concert things. So the whole idea of the, all these buildings, all these types mm -hmm. of activities that uh, Tico was talking about, they create this art and culture events that prevent the idea to get people's, uh, to prevent uh, kids and, and families involved in, in the sense of, of crime. Any other things, Tico, that I'm missing? Otra cosa oh, que quisieras añadir? No, todo bien. Okay. So here we're just going to leave you with uh, the last so you can see a, a, a video. Quiero agregar un dato. Ya, yeah, go ahead. El, en 2014 realizamos una actividad, como les comentaba, de una intervención con danza. Es un tipo de danza que le llaman danza comunitaria, que es a partir de los mismos movimientos que las y los participantes proponen y, y de ahí se construye una coreografía. Su coreógrafa eh, desarrolladora de este modelo, Tamara McClure, trabaja con los jóvenes eh, durante un mes, todos los días, eh, en, 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 durante varias horas al día normalmente son jóvenes eh, adolescentes entre los 12, 13, 15 y 16 años y al final presentan una, una coreografía en un teatro para muchos de ellos, la mayoría es la primera vez que asisten a un espacio cultural y también para sus familiares, para sus papás, para sus mamás eh, en 2014 que realizamos esta actividad eh, Teníamos a 24 jóvenes. Estos 24 jóvenes viven en una colonia que su nivel educativo es segundo de secundaria. A este grupo, lo trabajamos con ellos en 2014, los buscamos en 2017. Todos ellos estaban cursando los últimos semestres de la preparatoria. Es decir, en una comunidad donde el nivel educativo es segundo de secundaria, teníamos a un grupo intervenido que había eh, roto esa barrera y que estaba ya llegando un poco más allá en su aspiración educativa. Actualmente tenemos que volverlos a buscar, pero por lo menos tenemos conocimiento de que alrededor de 10 de ellos están cursando carreras universitarias. So I just want to make this note that, for instance, this is what we is interesting, the impact of these type of buildings that the majority of the education of these communities, second year, second grade, the, the education they have. And then through the events, um, this event they had with dance, dance and cultural events, that they were, the ones we were seeing that people come in, that the people who were involved in these type of activities, the majority of it, that almost all of them, they were able to kind of finish to high school. And at least five or six that have gone to get a university degree. So the impact, the transformational impact that it has as a catalyst, we're saying that this, this transformational impact to the people in the community, the people who are being involved in the program has had an enormous transformation in that sense. So I think that even just talking from the architecture, $100,000 changing 10 people, 15 people is already paid off. So these type of projects, I think that it would be interesting to kind of proliferate and kind of, they are, they, are, they are not about creating huge bombastic or kind of huge conditions of, of a building, but how to create spaces and then the mechanisms, the program, the design uh, uh, strategies that like Pico is creating that will be able to change and create opportunities for people. Anyways, thank you so much for joining us. I know so uh, we, we try to cover a lot and if you have any questions, please let us know. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todas y todas. Un gusto estar con Marcel. Igualmente, Tico, estar trabajando juntos en esto. Gracias. Gracias.